Hi, this is Fiona from the Indie Life Podcast team. This week's podcast is Rising Clyde. Host Ian Bruce talks to guests about a new campaign called Power to the People. Hello and welcome to Independence Live. I'm Ian Bruce and this is Rising Clyde, the programme where we look at the big issues and challenges facing the struggle for climate justice in Scotland and around the world. In today's episode, we're going to talk about a new campaign to confront the energy price crisis that we're all experiencing. It's called Power to the People. Now, a couple of episodes ago here on Rising Clyde, we had a fascinating discussion about the impact of the huge increases in the cost of living and the war in Ukraine on climate change and on the struggle for climate justice. Uh, that was with Maggie Chapman, MSP, and Ryan Morrison from Friends of the Earth Scotland. That remains absolutely relevant, and I urge you, if you're interested, to look back at that. It's still available on the Independence Live YouTube channel. But today, we want to talk about what we can do about it. And to help us with that, we're very happy to have with us three people who've been involved in developing this new campaign. Francis Curran, former MSP, helped kick off the idea as an initiative taken by Socialists for Independence. Matt Kerr is a Scottish Labour Party councillor in Glasgow City Council with something of a reputation for his campaigning work and his principal stands on things like the council budget. And Cole McHale is a climate activist who's been involved in a whole variety of actions and campaigns before, during and since COP26 in Glasgow. Thank you so much to all of you for being with us. Let's start by talking about the problem. I mean, we all know only too well that our energy bills have gone up and that they're going to shoot up again in October. But we may not all be so familiar with the details in terms of the nature and the scale of this problem. Matt, maybe you could kick us off with telling us what this means for the people you represent in Glasgow. Who's being hit hardest and how? Well, uh, it'll probably it won't come as much of a surprise to say that the people who are hit the hardest are the people who have already been repeatedly hit particularly over this uh, last decade or so, through austerity. So we've had food banks growing, obviously, in this part of Glasgow, um, as they have all over all over the country, sadly speaking. But we're now getting to the point where people are turning up to the food banks and, and, and specifically asking for food that doesn't have to be cooked because they can't cook their food. They, they, they can't pay for the power to do that. We've got st debt starting to rack up in terms of people are starting to miss payments on council tax. That's already starting to occur. And you just see the see the stress building. I there's an element of it, right enough though, that people haven't really had the full impact just yet in terms of the bills. There's a, there's a certain amount of we're in a bit of a phony war just at this period. We know it's going to get much much worse um, come come October when the the cap rises again. But we're in this period now for a few months where actually the previous cap is only starting to kick in now, and people are only starting to feel it themselves. We're going to see a massive. Uh, impact on the most vulnerable people in our society, the people who need need heat, whether it be through long-term illness, disability, um, where they have to spend more more time indoors, they have to have a warmer ho a home. The, you know, there's been there's, yeah, there's been a promise of some money coming from uh, Mr. S Mr. Sunak, um, but it, frankly, uh, it's not going to touch the sides, and it's not dealing with the issue, is it? It's not it's not dealing with the prices themselves for a guy who seems to be so concerned about inflation when it comes to wage rises. He's not so concerned about inflation when it keeps to when it comes to keeping costs down uh, for people's bills. That's that's deal with it at its source. And that's 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 where we are. Um, so there's a lot of people worrying out there right now in terms of how we came together. It's about how how do we direct that worry. There's no point in everybody wandering around fretting. We need to make sure that people have all the information they need to be able to challenge the companies when necessary and um, to be able to deal with uh, debt. That, that, that may occur, and to know the rights uh, going through going through that whole process. I want to get into the detail of the campaign in a moment, Matt. But just to, sure. I wonder if Francis and Cole have anything to add in terms of how people are feeling this, the impact of this. I think it's twofold. I think it's on the one hand, people are worrying about how they're going to heat their house or look after the, their children, and quite often people will put the prepayment card in the meter. And because they're not going to sit in the dark, 
especially families, and you need to cook your dinner. And so they're going to end up getting into debt elsewhere, which the Power of the People campaign can also help with. But I also think people are going to be really, really angry because the the energy companies are some of the richest people in the world, you know, and yet they're wanting us to pay. So I think there'll be a combination. And it's not just going to hit those who are the least well off in society, it's going to hit everybody. People who are on who think oh consider themselves to be on decent wages, their, their wages are going to be stolen for the energy companies. How's this being in in your circles in the climate movement, Cole? How's this being seen and felt? Well, I think I think I think what's important to say is that energy is just just one part of, of the problem, right? And that the broader cost of living crisis is. I mean, you're having people whose rent is being hiked by you know up, up to fifty percent across Scotland, who on top of rising energy bills are dealing with skyrocketing rent, food prices, etc. Right? So, so energy is just one part of this crisis. And in regard to the climate movement specifically, I, I think I think this is is key because you know we're 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 seeing calls for. Uh, increased fossil fuel extraction in light of in light of the energy crisis you're seeing calls for new oil fields to be approved under, under the guise of the energy crisis right but these calls of course lack any sort of detail or logic it takes on average 28 years for a new oil field which is approved tomorrow to come online right so the Tories fossil fuel industry etc calling for new oil fields to come online just now they're not going to help with the energy crisis just now. They're not going to help with the energy crisis for 28 years. Whereas we've got hundreds of renewable sites in this country and across the UK, which which can be approved within within two years, right? So again, a quick fix solutions to the crisis just now don't exist besides redistributing wealth and power. But when it comes to actually creating energy, if anything is going to relieve the crisis in the immediate term, it's not fossil fuels, it's, it's renewable energies, which can be these sites can be built and up and running within within two years in comparison to nearly three decades for, for fossil fuel yeah. infrastructure. I mean, just to, just today, I think there was a, I saw a press release from Friends of the Earth Scotland about SSE putting in planning application for a new gas power station at Peterhead, 910 megawatts or something, you know, which is, I'm sure we'll talk about this more in a, in, in a moment, but, you know, the, the way that the, the, the powers that be are reacting to the present situation mm-hmm. seems to be precisely you know, the, the opposite of what would seem to make sense. But um, we'll, we'll come on to that in a moment, you know. What about the government to some extent? Because obviously they're aware that it's a, that this is a huge crisis, that they have been, they've taken some palliative measures, right? So what, what exactly are those palliative measures and, you know, what's wrong with them? Francis? The government have said they're going to give those who are worst off uh, £650 um, to help with bills. And the rest is in October. This rise is going to be 120% by the end of the year mm-hmm. if we let them get away with it between April and October. So my my electricity and gas was £120. It's going to go up to 240 plus you add, need to add a bit on. So it's going to go up to, mine's going to go up to about £270. I mean, people just kind of live like that. And so, and that £400 that the government are giving me, I don't get to see it by the way. It goes straight to the, the energy company to bolster their profits. And the thing is, the big six energy companies have made thousands of billions of pounds from us over the decades, and they've got huge reserves. So our position is, never mind the £400, we want a price freeze in October. And that is up to the government. The government in Westminster can decide to do that. And these companies have got huge reserves. Now, where they've hidden them is another question. They know where they are. We don't know where they are. But... Let the companies take the hit. That's what the French government did. And we want the Westminster government to do that as well. But my last point is people sit at home and, and think they're the only ones that can afford to put the light on. We need to connect with each other to build a mass movement to force the Westminster government to back down on this. So is that the first and pr- principal demand of the campaign that we're, we're talking about here? Yeah. A price freeze, yeah? Is that a price freeze on the basis of post-April or pre-April? The first step is we get a price freeze for October. It's going to go up 51% again in October. That's the image. And it's going into the winter as well. It's going to hit people massively. But the other thing is we want the energy companies to um, to cancel all the fees that they charge for people going into debt. I mean, I got charged 20 quid extra because I didn't pay my bill in time. I wanted to see what happened. And the energy company couldn't tell me what that £20 was for. I was like, well, what debt collection agency, what's it for? They're just raking in the money. And also mm-hmm. they're going to hit people who are already in debt, who've got the least money to pay for it. And so we're immediately demanding that they drop, it's twenty pound, £10, then £20, then £33, and then they're talking about a court order. And we want them to drop all their fees. They can afford it. 
And we want the Scottish government to back us up on that as well. I think the campaign's come out with, with already some figures around the, the, the comparisons between, you know, the profits and the and the costs of a price freeze. Do you, do you have those to hand, Matt? How, how do those sort of compare, you know, what it would cost the government to freeze the prices and what kind of profits people are making? I don't actually have them to hand, Ian, but I will, I will say this. Um, what they've been doing, um, to from a point that, that uh, Francis just made there about where these companies are hiding their money, yeah, a lot of the, the people who are selling, you know, the retailers, if you like, of, of energy, claiming they're, they're skint and they're throwing their hands up in the air, they can't do a thing. In fact, they're starting to make people redundant. A friend of mine and a member of the campaign, incidentally, has just been made redundant through that. But the money's been made in the, in the, in the wholesale market, isn't it? So these are connected companies. They're not they're not disconnected companies. They've, they've separated them out, out themselves in that way and structured themselves in that way, a very deliberate way. And literally, we've had, we've had people uh, like in B, BP saying that they're, they're they're making more money than they know what to do with. I mean, that is obscene. You know, when there's people are, th- are stone throw stone throw from where I am right now who who are struggling to feed themselves. Um, it's 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 absolutely disgusting. And what, but what's happening here, the, the way the market is operating, the, the Ukraine crisis has been, uh, the war there has been blamed for some of this, but actually all it's done is exacerbated an, all, an already broken market. I mean, it, it, the fundamentals were all were all wrong to start with. You, so, yeah, the, the price of gas might have gone up because you're not getting that Russian supply anymore. But what they're not telling you is actually, you know, a lot of the gas we use in, in, in this country doesn't come from anywhere near Russia. It comes from just along the roads, you know. It comes from off our shores, and and the price of producing that hasn't increased, but the price to, to us has, because the world price has. Now that tells you something about how markets operate, um, how they don't operate any way around the needs of human beings, but also tells you, I think, tells you something about about an issue here about ownership, about who owns the assets we all rely on. Now, don't get me wrong. I get when you're starting a campaign like this. You don't necessarily go around every door and say, by the way, let's renationalise everything. But um, but let me tell you, we should be working, building towards that because it, it, this shows up the absolute nonsense um, of, of, the, of a free enterprise model being unleashed on a, fundam- on a fundamental human need. Francis talked about the, you know, the billions that have been made since privatisation. You know, B- BP, we used to own that. You know, we used to own British Gas. I mean, if you go into other things like British Telecom, or whatever, there are similar sorts of cri- crises in all, you know, Royal Mail where I used to work. Similar sorts of problems all over. And what I, what has simply been happening is the assets are, have been going in, they've been sweated. They'll take every last penny out of it, and then when there's nothing left left to flog, they'll throw their hands up in the air and say, "Oh, government, please come in, please come in and assist us, please bail us out." And that's that's where these re, re, the retail side of things are going right now. They're ready, some of them are ready to hand in the keys to the government because they say they can't operate. Well, they we're happy to operate making you know hundreds of millions and some some cases billions uh, over the, over the years uh, while the while the going was good. I, I have absolutely zero sympathy uh, with these people whatsoever. And it seems to me that that while we make the campaign here to support people, and do our best uh, in the here and the now to give people good support in terms of dealing with their bills and all the rest of that, and th- work through our the various aspects of our campaign, which we'll get into, it needs to lead to a a fundamental reassessment of who owns this country and who owns the assets we rely on. Because if it doesn't, then we'll be back having this conversation again in another decade, having having bailed them out. Because every time we hand out, when Sunak has has handed out uh, some cash to certain groups that he's decided uh, that are probably electorally uh, useful for him to do so, Every time he does that, he's not he, all he's doing is putting a, is putting a sticking plaster on, on the thing. And all that money, that money's not going in the hands of the pensioner. That, that money's not going in the hands of the, of, the, of the vulnerable person who's really struggling. That money's going straight into the likes of BP's profits. It's going straight into the, the, the likes of British Gas's profits and Centrica's profits and all the rest of that. This is a bailout for a, a failed financial and failed, uh, failed energy system. That's not where we need to be. Yes, support people here and now, but we need to we need to actually address the fundamentalists. If we don't, we can't allow this to continue. Let's talk about the campaign itself. Then you, you mentioned that. I mean, how do you envisage this campaign? How what, how are you going to build it? All right, we've got the central demand for a price freeze. How how is how are you going to put that into action? How are you going to build a campaign around that? 
I think the first thing is that we need to get everybody to understand that, that whether your prices of my, my gas and electricity goes up in October is a political decision. You know, it's not an economic decision, right? Nothing to do with that. It's actually a political decision. It's up to the Westminster government. It's not up to off game either. I mean, the government mm -hmm. set them up, can abolish them, can change the remit, can mm -hmm. tell them what to do. It's a political decision. Other governments have taken different political decisions. So can we influence a political decision? Well, yes, we can. And we have them. And can we get the government to make that? I think the answer is yes. We need the Scottish government to support a price freeze. But mobilising on the ground and bringing people onto the streets. There's a doubt I have here. So basically, we're talking about a UK government issue. They're the, they're the people who have the power to make most of these decisions. Yeah. But to what extent can the Scottish government play a part in this? Or even local councils, for that matter? I mean, is it a campaign directed solely at the Westminster government? What can the Scottish government or local governments do? The point is, anybody and anybody and everybody in power has a responsibility to do something useful with it. I think we just start from that place, right? And whether you technically have the powers to do things is, is near, in, in some in some senses is neither here nor there. You should be attempting. So it's obvious that lion's share of this actually sits with the UK government. Of course, it does. Um, so the UK government um, should uh, be getting real about, um, you know. Maybe if they could put it in, in terms of their fears about inflation, maybe they'd pay attention, who knows. Um, but they, they can do something a bit off, Jim. They can do something about, about setting the absolute rate, if you like. What the Scottish government can do, and we've discussed this in some of our groups, and in fact, the Socialist yeah. Friendly uh, meeting, it, it came up at that. There's a very good presentation by a man called Alan McIntosh. He's a, something of a, an expert, some of a, of a guru on, on, on debt advice and welfare rights. He um, talking about say you know doing like raising the level of, uh, at the level of cash that people can keep in their bank accounts you know, in an investment situation so that they can better function. Um, there are things perhaps that could be done. I think uh, could be done around uh, council tax as well because um, as again as Francis alluded to earlier on, you know people will be more likely if they have to choose between paying the council tax bill and paying the electricity bill to keep the lights on. And, you know. And, and, and keep the dinner on, um, they're more likely to, to default on their council tax. That seems the obvious place to do. So what can be done there, both at Scottish government level to, to support councils to, to deal with, because they can have a problem, so to, to deal with that problem, but, but also perhaps to, to think about how um, deal with a, a debt in the future, because because there's some really strict rules um, that are currently in place around, uh, in terms of councils and dealing with council tax debt and how you must pursue it. So that's that could be looked at, I think, and I think it should be. But also councils themselves. So we're sitting in Glasgow, or I'm sitting in Glasgow anyway. You, <laughs> you're not here, but I am. Um, you know, it's, I'm, I raised this at a council meeting there on Thursday when there was a debate on the uh, cost of living crisis, as it's been termed. And we talked. You know, there's been a long running campaign in Glasgow about trying to reopen facilities post COVID, and without getting into the old party political debates around the rights and wrongs of all that. I mean, there's a, there's now a pressing need to reopen these things immediately, because. If we, or at least have a have a really, really uh, clear plan on how to get it done quickly, because if we don't, people are going to really struggle. We can use these facilities to to give pe people places, warm places to go to actually, you know, uh, sit down, and get some get some company, get some support, um, but also places to cook. I'm not talking about necessarily the kind of pantries and the you know the food banks that are already there, but actually, you know, giving people places where they can actually do these things and do them actually, and actually the process of them doing them together might <laughs> wouldn't do any harm either um, in, in terms of the, uh, the wider social need to be honest those are practical steps we can do so we can get the centers open immediately we should be doing that now and if we don't have a plan in place now then what worries me i know how slow councils work <laughs> if we don't have a plan, if we don't have a plan in place now then it'll be christmas before we know it we'll be in the depths of winter and we'll have facilities sitting empty while people are sitting at home, cold, rather with debt and, and panicking. If people could come into these places, get some warm, get some grub, get some support and advice while they're at it, I think that, that's a great opportunity. So there are challenges there for all levels of government. And actually the challenges, uh, I think, as a trade unionist as well, I think there's a, there's a role here for, for, for trade unions and all of this too. Um, you know, there's a lot of expertise there in the trade union movement. It can be brought to be a lot of resource there uh, as well. And, you know, that's something I, I've been looking into through my own union and the communication workers union. I think all of us can have a role to play. But anybody who holds any position, that's a fundamental thing in any wrong, if you like. If you hold a position of power or authority, you should be using it. Right? And you should be pushing it to the absolute limits of what you can.
as we all know, there are all sorts of other debates going on about where power should lie, but we can continue to have them <laughs> while we get on with actually using it. So I want to give us a bit of time to come back to some of the bigger issues in relation to climate at the end. But just in terms of the nitty gritty nuts and bolts of the campaign, Francis, what should people be doing? What do you want? How do you want to build this? Yeah, um, we've put a call out across Scotland to say to people, you know what, whatever you're involved in, set up a part of the people committee in your local area. During COVID, people just spontaneously set up community campaigns in their area to help out their neighbours. So we're saying come together. We've got a whole load of information about debt, about how to support people, about taking on the, the energy companies, about preventing people from getting forced prepayment meters. So set up a local campaign in Glasgow, where me and Matt are. Um, and we've already got campaigns getting set up in uh, Inverness, Cumbernauld, Lanarkshire, I've forgotten all the other areas. There's a whole number of areas where people are already doing it in Glasgow, where we are. And we're going into communities, we're knocking doors, we're music, we're talking to people, we're giving them the information that they need. And we are going to, like the anti, some of us have got some experience in the anti tax campaign, go Google it for young people at call. And it actually brought down Thatcher and it, it got a government change. And so we're going to use some of the um, things that we learned in that campaign, street by street, door by door, encourage people to join up and get involved in this campaign to both support people in their community, but also, and to put demands in the council to, to open uh, community warm centres in their community, but also to come together and protest as well. And we've got a really big protest planned. That's the first thing that we're going to take to the energy companies and the government. I don't know if Matt wants to give the date and the details of that. But when you get together, instead of sitting shouting at the telly or being really angry yeah. or, or just feeling powerless to do anything, coming together really makes a difference. I can, I can vouch for it. I can recommend it. And so that's one of the things that we're going to be doing. We'll be in the doors this week in Glasgow talking to people and hearing what people have got to say as well about the campaign. And everybody's got skills and, and energy and ideas to bring. We're going to be a very talented bunch fighting this by the time we finish. Carl, I know, I know there's been a lot of talk about the cost of living crisis within different bits of the climate movement, but it is not clear to me that people are actually, what people are doing is quite sort of coordinated, you know, say with this, between this initiative and the various different things that are going on in the climate movement. How, how can that sort of those things be brought together, do you think? Well, well, if, if, if it's not coordinated just now, and I, I agree that it's not, then this is the perfect sort of opportunity for, for uh, as something that people can get behind, because, because uh, as as we've we've outlined, this this energy crisis relates intrinsically to climate, and I think you're right, is that the climate movement needs to be has to be more more unified on these things and um you know we've taken to calling ourselves the climate justice movement specifically around cop but and I, th I think as a result it's time high time we put we put we put that that term climate justice into action and that means rallying behind campaigns like this one which i don't have an explicitly sort of scientific with regards to climate change element but but are but are key, key to you know for getting through getting through the winter and you know that that means climate activists piling on to the scottish government to to get them to pick a side in this thing because what matt's what matt says is right regardless of whether the scottish government have have the power to change things like energy prices across the uk they do and are obligated to indicate to the scottish population whether they are on their side or on the side of, of, of energy CEOs who have taken away millions and millions of pounds, right? Um, and if you look at their voting record, both on climate and on things like a rent freeze last week, it is very, very murky currently as to as to whose as to whose side they are on. So, so a unified climate movement working together with community organisers fighting back on the energy crisis is is where we should where we should be going and where I think the climate movement wants to go. So, so yeah, this is the perfect this is the perfect campaign to prove that. Uh, and, and if you look at how concretely how, how the energy crisis can tie into the climate crisis and it relates to what we were talking about earlier with regard to councils, right? If you look not, not too far from where I am in Lanark or where Matt is in Glasgow and Francis, um, you've got you've got North Ayrshire, right? Where where last last council term you had former landfill sites being taken into council ownership and having solar farms built on those former landfill sites by the council, right, with a, with a hostile Scottish government who was cutting their budgets, or attempting at least to cut their budgets every year, right? So, so, so there are, there are there, and, and that, those those solar farms produced, are on track to produce, I think, 270% or 77% of 
of electricity for the region, right? And of course, that is then sold back to stakeholders like the NHS, and that's that's how community wealth building, which is the the sort of economic strategy that the North Ayrshire Council took, that's that's how it works, right? So 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 there are there are concrete things that that councils can do, and it's about the climate movement pressuring them to do so in coalition with with a range of groups fighting back on on the energy crisis. Um, and I think it's important that that we that we spotlight the instances in which these things have been done differently, because we should all be talking about the fact that your council can buy that landfill site and build a solar farm on it. They just don't want to think that they can buy that landfill site and build a solar farm on it. Um, or they want you to think that they can't do it, right? So this notion of power, how it's used and how it's manifest itself is, is really interesting and very, very relevant, relevant to this discussion, because decision makers always want you to think that they are more powerless than they are specifically in this country. If you look at things like, again, if you look at the rent freeze debate last week, ministers determined to make the public believe that civil servants decide and ministers ministers have to take that civil servant's advice, right? And 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 that that is very, very, very important to this discussion specifically, right? And to the climate discussion, because because it's ministers who decide, it's the people who you elect who have, have the decision on these things. And, and as I say, in relation to the energy crisis specifically, we have to remember have to remember these things because if we are to call on call on decision makers to take the radical action that that the scale of this crisis necessitates, then we are going to have to get them to make difficult decisions. And the argument which they are going to put to us, and indeed are putting to us, is that they simply cannot do it because the law says they cannot. Something that has experience in, and we are we are going to need to be able to unpick these arguments and to, to remind them. That there are there are things they can do, and that they are not bound by those who advise them. They're bound by those who elect them. Before we run out of time, I do want to try and try and link it up with the sort of broader picture. I mean, obviously, this is a campaign targeting a very real, concrete problem that people are facing right now, mm -hmm. and will be facing over the next four few months, especially as winter approaches. And that's obviously the right thing to do. But I just wonder whether it it's necessary or useful within this campaign to raise those broader issues, which actually Cole talk, to, touched on uh, at the beginning of this discussion, I think, you know, like where the energy comes from in the first place, you know, and, and how much of it we use to do what, you know, um, you know, those sort of fundamental questions mm -hmm. about climate justice and the kind of reshaping of the way we live that's kind of we need in order to tackle that. Is that something that, you know, we have to sort of like park aside while we deal with, you know, freezing the prices now, mm -hmm. How, how do we make the bridges between the, the sort of immediate thing and the bigger picture? I'll be very quick. So, so this at its heart, like, like the climate crisis, as Matt outlined earlier on, is a question of how we distribute resources and wealth. OK, so, so the climate crisis is also a question of how, how resources and wealth are distributed in, a, in an international context um, when we're talking about the divide between the global north and global south, right? But the, the energy crisis is, exact, is exactly that too. Mm -hmm. the, the, line, the line is that we're all experiencing the energy crisis. We're not all experiencing the energy crisis at all. There is, there's a class of people in this country who just actually have more disposable income than other people. And th 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 that divide exists. So... At the crux of the climate question and at the crux of the energy question is who has what and who owns what and who owns the the product of of the of the labor right and where where the value of the labor goes and who absorbs it right and, and it's, it's not all to do with marx's theory of surplus labor right but, 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 but quite a lot of it is, <laughs> but it is though. <laughs> so as I say, the, the the crux of these issues, climate and the energy crisis, are interlinked everywhere you look because they're both a question of distribution of resources and how they're distributed. Yeah, I, I mean, I take all that, but the, to what extent get, do you? Yeah. I mean, not what? talking about the surplus theory of, of <laughs> what I'm talking about. That's the that, next but episode. About, to what? <laughs> that's the next episode. But to what extent in this campaign do we do we should we already be raising the issues? You know, the broader sort of climate justice issues. Well, yeah? Yeah, this question relates to energy. The Scottish government in January did their fair share of, of outsourcing our resources to BP and Shell for the next for the next period, right? Um, so, so I think we need to be making those points. We need to be making because the the question, the point that I was making pre previously about resources, right, is 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 fundamentally related to this campaign as well. Because questions around energy that we're talking about just now, the Scottish government just, as I say, literally handed for a pittance large portions of Scotland's wind power to, to the fossil fuel industry and to the energy industry that we that this campaign very much sets its sights on. So 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 yes, we should be making a very, very conscious effort to tie these things together and to work in coalition with the climate movement to do that.
And Ian, if I could just um, jump back, I know I've been speaking a lot, but uh, we referenced earlier on um, that France set a four percent cap on on its increases. That isn't because President Macron's just a, a, a mad lefty, you know, because he certainly isn't. He? But I tell you what, he did have at his disposal. Um, he owns the energy generating capacity, or through the government at least, the government uh, owns the energy energy uh, generating capacity of France. So if he decides, and the government of France decides that the prices are not going up, they don't go up. Now, if the UK government decided to do that, it could do it through off gem as Francis has said, mm -hmm. can do it. But there's then that what they then fear is is that their pals, and they are their pals, not our pals, and they'll start handing handing back the keys and they'll take business elsewhere and all the rest. But that, that's just it's absurd. It's absolutely absurd. It actually shows up what what the capacity of the state can be if it, if it's you if it's used properly. And that's in the hands of a centrist, for goodness sake. Well, I'm being generous calling them that. You know, if you actually think if you actually had had an activist government that actually had that actually had you know, owned these resources and used them on behalf of the people properly and had not not to rerun the, the nationalizations in this country that uh, the past or in, in which case, circumstances in which you had the same bad management right, right enough, but actually proper accountability where people actually own the assets that they help build um, and that they rely on uh, day in day out. The, the difference. And accountability there is really, really important. And actually, when you're chapping a door, talking about somebody's electricity bill right now, you can, without referring to Marxist theory, you can. You know, people instinctively understand mm -hmm. when they see the CEOs getting the payouts they're getting, the, the, the share options they're getting, the billions that are being made off the back of resources and the back of assets that were built by them, built by, by the state, the, the people of this country, and taken uh, from them and handed, uh, handed to Tory cronies. Uh, a number of years mm -hmm. ago, people instinctively understand that that's wrong, and they, they and they do un, uh, instinctively understand the connection. There's far more support out there for public ownership uh, than many of the national politicians will let you know of. across the parties. It has to be said, it's actually support for it is very high. People understand that that's a wrong. People know that even in relatively better times economically, that was still mess in terms of who owns the assets of this country was still driving the inequalities. There's a reason when we had when we had shifts in in, in income distribution, you know, in the in the kind of Blair years, Blair likes to talk about what, how great it was with tax credits. Well, tax credits were all right, but it didn't deal with who owned the country. So wealth inequality continued to grow. And until we, you know, and that was in a relative boom period, relatively speaking, to where we are now. If we don't deal with who owns the country, we can't deal with the cost of living crisis because the cost of living crisis isn't something that just turned up yesterday. It's something that's always existed for working people. It's just showing up now because, frankly, some of the no offence here, but some some of the, some of the media are starting to notice that their bills are that you know they, they maybe one one few one fewer glass of wine when they when they go out on on expense accounts. Some of them, uh, or, or in some of the in some of the media outlets, that's what's happening. Mm. People are starting to notice. They're still able to cope with it. Many, many of the, these higher earners, of course, that crisis has never not been there for working people. It's never not existed. It's been exacerbated in recent times, which is why you've seen food banks existed. It's been exacerbated by welfare cuts. It's been exacerbated by effectively a 40-year pay freeze for working people. Of course it has. And it's been exas exacerbated by the current uh, crisis in terms of energy prices spiking. But at its fundamental, who owns the country? Who owns the resources? Who owns the things that we all rely on? And if we don't get to grips with that, then nothing changes. There's consensus broken out. We um, might have differences of opinion and we'll keep discussing it about the future of Scotland, <laughs> but we're all in favour of public ownership. And seeing this campaign, if the energy companies come back to the government and go, oh, we're skint, we can't afford it, well, that, that's fine, give us the keys, mm -hmm. we'll have it back. But the start of this is a big protest outside Scottish Power in Glasgow, massive new building that they've built on the 12th of August from, six oh, from 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock, the 12th of August, Four o'clock to six o'clock outside Scottish Power, energy companies take the hit and the government takes the hit and ordinary people can actually heat their houses in the winter. So come along and we'll, we'll all join up then. A bit of connection and solidarity. Thank you so much, Francis. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Cole. I'm afraid we're out of time. That's the end of this episode of uh, Rising Clyde. Thanks for listening to Scottish Independence Podcasts. 
don't forget to subscribe and come back next week when our podcast will be looking at borders in an independent Scotland. Don't miss it. See you then. Bye now. Bye now.